Um, are there questions in the room? Please, yes. Um, so one of the questions that, that I have is, what are the challenges with, I think, um, getting to plain language science is actually getting the scientists in the room to receive the message. Um, I know, you know, for ourselves, um, you know, we've done a couple of workshops here and there on those things, but strategies to get the scientists in the room to actually hear um, these kinds of talks and take advantage of these resources, I think, is, is a challenge. And I don't know if, if, in your experience, if you've had if you have some successful strategies that you could share. Um, my successful strategy actually involved Barry and Mary Ann and Rochelle because they scheduled a bunch of plain language training through OAR, which was extremely well attended. And also at NOS, Carol Kavanaugh had me come out and give a couple NOS uh, classes for NOS. It's just taking advantage of the fact that you've got some of these resources, bringing them together. Um, Whereas I don't and I can't give free plain language training to feds anymore, much to my chagrin because I love doing it. It appeals to my inner ham here. Um, there are, there are uh, people available who can do it for the fed, through the federal government for free, and it's through plainlanguage.gov. However, that's a very limited number of people who are able to give the training. I think in NOAA, Fran and Fisheries. Um, Karen Robin. Karen might. Uh, she she was a trainer. I think she had um, her job changed, okay. and she might not be able to do it. But you might check with her. So there are a couple people within NOAA. Uh, Terry Layton uh, from the Department of Commerce is a trainer. If she has time, she could come out and do it. I know she's come out and um, given it for Nesdis. Some of you may know her as Anata. Um, and uh, so. So the problem is there's a huge demand for it, few people who can really, really do it. Um, if, even though I'm not supposed to do plain language training for feds, I could probably do it in a seminar something like, like this um, and get people to do it, and I would be happy to do that. Um, it wouldn't, my presentation, my plain language <coughs> presentation is slightly different than the official one, but the, it, it does hit the, a lot of the, in fact, all of the key points in there. Jana, are there opportunities for people in this room to get trained, to be trainers for plan language? Yes. Um, in fact, uh, but boot camp was yesterday, the 14th. <laughs> nice question. Nice time. Thank you very much. Um, but, <laughs> but again, uh, you might check with uh, plainlanguage.gov and find out when the next boot camp is going to be. Uh, we, I was at the plain language meeting last week because we gave a report on the, plain, on the uh, Center for Plain Languages report card. And I'm encouraged because there are more people who want to be trained as trainers. I don't know how many they have right now. When I was a trainer, there were only 12 of us for the entire federal government. And this is on top of doing you know, a, a regular job. So I think that if you have any scientists who are interested in doing this, if they express an interest, grab onto them, get them some training. You can contact me. You can contact somebody from the Center for, um, you know, the, the Plain Network, the, the Federal Network, and take a, you know take advantage of the fact that they want to do this and help them. Help them. Yes, ma'am. So as a scientist, um, at the risk of being grabbed onto. Um, <laughs> do not let this woman leave her room. <laughs> um, one of the biggest problems with scientists, particularly early career and mid-career scientists, going out and doing this is time. Yes. So the group that I work in, there are at least three of us who would be glad. We have a good interest in teaching, in public outreach, things like this. We have 12 people working on a project which needs 25. Yes. How do we fit this in? Is there any mechanism? And of course, there is no professional encouragement or reward, there is no way to fit it into a NOAA schedule, into a work plan, any of this. So is there any chance, you know, it's encouraged all the time, but is there any real backing to say, no, carve time out of your schedule and do it? Because that's what it would take. That's got to be a personal decision to do it. And I think one of the things, and I, and I, I can I said it when I was at NOAA, and I can say it now that I'm not at NOAA. One of the things that I was disappointed in is 
there were a lot of people, scientists, who wanted and did, went out and did excellent um, public outreach and communication. They were not rewarded for it. Um, it was not in their job description. It was, in some cases, penalized. Um, it was not seen as the great benefit that it is, because not only does it reflect well on you as an individual, as, as an individual scientist, but it reflects well on your organization, that you know, your organization wants you to go out and share the, the work with, that you're doing with, with wider audiences. Um, I know we did try to work hard with the OAR communicators to try to improve that. I don't know if that was ever successful, but um, that was a... Uh, a great disappointment to me that more people weren't being rewarded for it. Now, getting back to your question, um, I think if you want to do that, essentially you've got to do it on your own time. You can start small if you've got to speak to a, a I, class I, or, or whatever, speak a series like, you know, kind of have some time. Don't, it, it's easy to become a time sink for you to take a lot of your time. Do the things you, you can do. I mean, I would say don't do, just to say, I just don't have time to do any of it. Do small things and try to encourage more people to do small things, too. As far as institutional support, there is, there is an administrative order that kind of pertains to supervisors encouraging and allowing uh, people to uh, participate in these sort of uh, outreach and education activities. Um, however, as far as rewards and you know, actually being encouraged in a real way, yeah. You might be able to get probably more traction or most traction if you convince management that it's important and needed. And usually the budget hook is about the best one you can get for that. I know <coughs> our, my group actually really does recognize it, think it's important, and you know is moving along that way and supports it. But without that, you're right, they're not going to allow you you know, they're going to say, well, you know, I need you to do this. That's great. That's your own personal development. I need you to do this when reality really does advance the agency. Well, so try to convince your management that it's I guess, support. It's probably I guess the best the question route. is more really, you know, what do we, because personally, I, I do a number of outreach efforts on my own time. <laughs> but as, a, as an agency, you know, there's lip service given to this being important. Yes. But how do you get more traction to actually make it a priority? And that means time and money. It does. And one thing that could happen is because you start small and people start hearing about you, you're a fabulous speaker, you've got great stories to tell, you're more and more in demand, you know, you have larger and larger opportunities. Um, it, it can kind of either snowball or grow slowly. Um, but it, 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 takes, it does take work and wait. Oh, okay. After, um, but it's you know there, there, there's no there's no one size fits all, and and everybody has to do it according to what you know his or her own abilities are, time is. But I I would encourage you to do something at least. Um, it's it's there's so many wonderful science stories just in NOAA alone, and I even know that the um, National Science Foundation when you apply for a grant there is a part for what kind of uh, outreach do you have that's associated with this? So that, that's part of your uh, NSF granting request. So you have to make some time to do this. Um, it, it's a huge responsibility because what you're doing is, you know, in some cases can be a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week job. But, you know, the, 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 you know the, the worst science is science that people don't know about. You know, how can you be doing something good and not, and not telling anybody? You have a comment online, question. Okay, so the comment from Marjorie. Hey, Marjorie. While it is easy to write clearly and easy to write accurately, it is difficult to do both simultaneously. She's right, which is the crux of the difficulty in communicating science. Yet science writing is its own specialty, Andy Revkin being one example. Is Noah considering hiring professional science writers in contrast <laughs> to general communications officers who are trained and experienced in taking complex science and writing public accessible articles and presentations. I don't know, are they? We have a science writer in our group uh, was hired and she helps with all the reports. She proofs them and smarts them up. So that, that's an interesting topic too because I was out in Boulder and we, I gave a media training and um, 
plain language training out in Boulder, and a couple people approached me for help in writing science papers. That's not my area of expertise. You know, so you would need somebody who knows how to write science papers <coughs> that is, are an easy to understand language. Um, I, I think uh, one reason I was hired because I was a newspaper reporter and didn't have a science background. So I was asking a lot of questions. What does this mean? I don't understand this. You know, don't help me. And I was fortunate because the OAR scientists were so were scientists were so generous with their time and mostly patient with me that they helped me come up with something that was easy to understand. I'm not sure a uh, you know when you uh, a professional science writer, um, I think you just need a very good basic writer uh, to help translate some of the complicated science into understandable language. Yes? Just a comment on that. I'm actually a technical writer. I yep. wrote proposals and kind of digested IT information. So I think that's one of the reasons in the little bucket of why I was hired. That was one of those And do you translate that into plain language, easy to understand language? Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm one of those scientists that actually enjoys talking with non-technical people. It's just a personal thing I enjoy. But I'm, the, I think the question I have for you is, what sense do you get that this is taught or considered important, say, in graduate school? Because when I was in graduate school, write my technical journal articles, and when I would say I'd go to fishing groups or you know just volunteer environmental groups to just speak at luncheons and stuff, they looked at me like I was crazy. Like, why are you doing that? These people aren't going to understand what you're saying anyway. I can't speak for what's being offered in schools now, because, uh, but I do know that there is an emphasis through the science organizations on science communication. I mean, witness the number of uh, you know, science communication workshops that AGU offered uh, this, this fall. Um, what was bad was, there were like 22, 23,000 people at AGU, Rochelle, and you know it was jam packed. And you're trying to get all the, uh, tell your science presentations. A lot of the, the science communication workshops I went to were well attended, but a lot of times the scientists say they were there at um, uh, in lieu of doing something that was going to advance their science. So you know people are making, as, as you said, they're making a choice to do this. Um, I think that there are also more science communication programs now being offered in some of the colleges and universities where people can actually uh, learn to be a science communicator, uh, which, which is encouraging. But again, to me, it, it all comes down to you as scientists because you're doing the work, you're, you've got the stories, you know what you know, why you went into this work, what your passion is, why, you know, why you keep studying one thing for 20 years, which always amazed me, uh, you know, some of the scientists with whom I work. Because I have the attention span of a gnat. I, you know, have to do different things. To study something for a, an entire career is, you know, I, it, it's awesome to me. Janet, can we take a question online? Yeah. Uh, if there are any questions online, you need to unmute your phone using star six. Please go ahead. <laughs> or anybody come up with a different word for story? Is anybody Googling? You have to unmute, Tracy. I don't, they can do it themselves, but I'll do it. The question. conference is now in talk mode. Folks online, do you have any questions? Comments? Questions? Yes. This is Annie Yo. Hi, um, Annie. How are you? It's good to catch up with you. Um, yes. I have a question about knowing your dealers. Well, yeah. here in Hawaii, the tsunami and Fukushima disaster are still very much um, issues in the back of people's mind, of people's minds. And when they find out to look at Noah, I always get questions about: Is it safe to swim in the ocean? Can you eat seafood? And they they tell me they get some information from like fear mongering, misinformed websites about the how unsafe and dirty wax of their walk. That. I'm wondering, can you suggest some ways in which um, we can communicate to others how to tell whether an information source is reliable or not? Ah, good question. So Annie's question was, how can you tell people whether a news source is credible or not? Um, the conference is now in silent mode. That's a great question, and I think it's up to people uh, individually. So there are certain writers 
like uh, Marjorie mentioned, Andy Redkin, um, whom I trust. Justin Gillis of the New York Times is a great writer. I, I guess I'm a traditionalist, so I would go to New York Times, the Associated Press, um, you know, and to me, any of the traditional service, uh, news services, although 60 Minutes, which used to be the, the gold standard, has, has fallen down considerably in, in my estimate, uh, estimation. Um, I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure about any of the current ones, uh, because everybody's putting stuff up like on Huffington Post. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. I think progress is pretty good. Um, it, 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 it's a, that's a very, very tough, tough uh, question. Uh, again, it's who, who do you trust? You know, who, who hasn't let you down the most? Let's put it that way. And are there other questions online? And if there are, can you hit star six? Because when we mute, unmute all, it gets too noisy. So just hit star six and ask your question. Hi, Jenna. Yes. This is Jason. How you doing? Oh, fine, Jason. How are you? Mazel Hi. I actually had a question for you about working with alternative audiences. Um, you know, I do some volunteer work at the Smithsonian, and they've actually had authors, playwrights, yep. that kind of thing. And I've been binge watching numbers lately about a mathematician. Do you have advice for how, as scientists, we can work with those kind of audiences? How do we even reach out to them? Yeah, that's a great question, Jason. Thanks. And you know, you being a magician too, you have also uh, found a different way to communicate some great science with different audiences. I think you need to, uh, you know, as I said, know know your audience. Um, there are a lot of different ways where people are receiving information. Like we were at the Exploratorium in, in San Francisco, uh, which is amazing because people are learning while they're having fun. And Jason, I think you know, as a, as a magician, you know, when people are learning something and they're not aware of learning something, they, uh, they, they might tend to remember it a little more, too. Um, I, I would say look for opportunities where you're comfortable talking, uh, groups that you're comfortable talking to, and then maybe branch out. Uh, you know, again, make yourself available. If anybody else has any suggestions, let me know. Miriam? So I have two things. One is there are NOAA does look sometimes for unique ways to do this. And so one example is if you Google the Octonauts, which for anyone with small children, you'll be familiar with this show. It's an animated series. And NOAA actually has a partnership now with the Octonauts ah, to okay. sort of infuse ocean exploration and ocean science into the Octonauts episodes. Mm -hmm. um, Rochelle is one of our leads on the Exploratorium Partnership out in San Francisco. There's a NOAA exhibit right now at the Maryland Science Center. Um, and then around the country, there are something called Cafe Scientifique, yeah, or Science yeah. Cafes. Yeah. So there's one in Arlington, Virginia. One in Annapolis. Yep. And um, they're pretty easy to find. And they're always looking for speakers. So yep. if you're interested in talking with folks, those are sort of easy ways to, and you're talking to an interested science audience, right? You're not showing up for a cafe scientific if you don't care about science. So it can be a way if you're a scientist who's interested in talking to non-scientists, yep. but doesn't want to be completely robust. <laughs> no, that's, that's a great idea. Audience. And you get some accidental audience on the fringes who are just right. there to drink. That's yeah. right. And it's also uh, cafescientific.org. I think <clears throat> you can find them near your zip code, near your home. You know, and also, too, um, comic strips are a great way. We used oh, yeah. Mark Trail for yeah. years, you know, for years, but he, that was an effective way to get some science stuff across. Uh, Jim Toomey now with Sherman uh, Lagoon has, has adopted kind of NOAA fisheries and has done some great stuff with NOAA fisheries uh, on fisheries issues. So, you know, you, you try to figure out where, you, you know, where, where your audience is getting their information and then trying to insinuate yourself uh, and, and do something with that. Question, yeah. I was actually just going to make another comment. I actually did a question, too. Um, but if, if you're a scientist and in a NOAA office that's looking for opportunities to do outreach and get the word out, I know some every office is different, but um, try to figure out who does outreach in your office, because I know people have come to me and said, we have a research paper coming out. Who should we share that information with? Like, who should we offer to give presentations to? And I know I'm always happy to pull those lists. Sometimes I just know people off the top of my head. But I think your first go-to should be outreach people in your office if That's you right. have them. Because that might be like an easy, quick list for them to grab. 
Yeah, and and definitely, and and this. Uh, you know, speaking of the former public affairs officer, I know you're all in contact with your public affairs officers at NOAA, and they know exactly when you've got papers coming out or when you're giving presentations or... Before it happens. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> week, weeks before it happens. And, you know, if you um, want to make yourself available to be a speaker at maybe a, a scientific uh, cafe or some, or some other uh, venue, Talk to them. They'll know of these places, and they will glom on to you and give you so much, so many opportunities. It might be, as you say, you, you some embarrassment of riches. But you know, I think everybody should do it at least once. Some people will like it and take to it. Um, other people will say, "No, this isn't for me." And you'll, you know, find some other way to uh, communicate with people. You could even even offer it a school to answer questions. You know, you can do it online if you don't want to talk no, to people. No, a kid's day has five, over 500 kids come into right. the building. Right. You do a class. Do a class. You know, that's, a, that's an easy way uh, to, to kind of get your, your talking feet, as I, as I would say. Um, uh, you know, even invite people to your house or something. If you're having a party, pull a couple people around and say, well, I'm thinking of talking about this. You know, do you understand what I'm talking about? You know, use your friends, your neighbors, your family um, as founding boards. They will be brutally honest. Believe me, they will be brutally honest. And if you want practice, Noah has the local Toastmasters, right. and yeah. be more than welcome more people. Yes, yes. Uh, I forgot to mention that there is a great Toastmasters uh, Noah Toastmasters group, and there was um, you know the thing that. Uh, brought Toastmasters to mind to me originally was there was a Toastmasters group and I forgot where it was and it, it, uh, it, it was just for scientists and I thought, how cool is this? This is wonderful. And then I learned about the, uh, the one at GFDL. So I'm really encouraged by the fact that a lot of scientists, mostly younger scientists, who want who see this as important and want to do it. Yes. So uh, kind of from the flip side, uh, I think one of the nature Part of the nature of the beast at NOAA is that we have so much information all the time, and there are millions of things that we want to promote. Um, and I, if I had my druthers, I would just like promote everything, but then people would hate our Twitter because we'd be tweeting all the time, um, and all sorts of other things. But as we try to filter things out, mm -hmm. um, what are sort of the things, and how should we be communicating with scientists about what we're choosing to put up and what we're not choosing not to put up? And what should we be looking for in terms of like, you know, talking, pinpointing things where we say, yes, we want to promote this, and no, we don't. Well, one easy way to do that is, you know, uh, follow the news. Not follow your nose, follow the news. So when the polar vortex was starts getting cold, um, I would have done exactly what OAR did, find out who the Arctic experts were, get them available. There was a geek talk that uh, Jim Overland participated in. Um, there's a variety of really innovative and creative ways where people are sharing science. And a lot of the NOAA communicators know that what they are, that the public affairs officers know. But follow the news. Say, you know, if you see something happening, say, wait, I've just done some research on that, or I have a little part of it. Um, that's a great way to get that story across. And then I know that NOAA Communications tries to look a year ahead, you know, plan the year ahead. What are the big events coming up? And of course, you can't um, plan for a natural disaster, but at least they have a little bit of an idea of things that are coming up throughout the year and, and to try to find a slot, uh, you know, like during Shark Week or something that Discovery had. You know, I would have loved to have had something on the NOAA building yeah. facing the shark, you know, right. maybe a picture of it, you know. And, but, you know, of course, that was tons of money and we couldn't do that. But, you know, see what else is going on and see how you can fit into that particular um, new spot. Yes, and for the scientist turned communicator, yes, I turn to the dark side or the light side, depending upon which way you want to look at it. Um, and having to make those things, our group has now has 150. Used to have about 250 research projects ongoing every year, and making decisions about what to promote and not was, as you can imagine, somewhat challenging. And um, part of the the fruit that we grabbed for was those that were translatable. Some of our yeah. science, you, it would be really rough to translate and make it understandable. Just, so you grab the food that's easier to do. You try and be strategic. And also, those that you can make a connection with John Q. Public. Some of the things, you know, you want to go A to B, A to B to C at maximum. You don't want to go farther than that because you'll lose them. So, you know, what, what can I explain? 
that says, oh, that matters to me, oh, I can see why that's important. So what can you translate, what can you make personal? And then strategic as to what will, I hate to be somewhat crass, but what will, will get interest in you, get your, your Congress people and their, their that's right, con right, constituents interested, because, I mean, face it, one of the reasons why you do this, you get two reasons. One, you want to promote science and intelligence and literacy, and in other words, you want money for Congress. <laughs> well, and that, I mean, and that goes back to showing why, you know, why should people care? Why does it matter? You know, yeah. so um, it would always drive me nuts when people wanted to cut funding from something because they said, well, we don't know what this is. That's the problem. They don't know what it is. They don't know how it affects But that's our problem important. if we're not communicating why it's mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Well, that's... That, that's part of it, too, but uh, sometimes people just don't want to know. <laughs> but you also have to be very careful on what you promote and things, so you don't want to set yourself up for being on the, you know, why is the government funding this like the shrimp on the treadmill? There are very good reasons for the shrimp on the treadmill research. However, that wound up being under the, you know, why are we funding this research thing that, you know, kind of backfired a little bit. <clears throat> You've got to be a little careful thinking about how other folks might, you know, skewer you. <laughs> yeah, there, there's always the be careful what you wish for uh, yeah. aspect of it. You know, cause you that just was viral. Yeah, you just, you just, you just we, might get it. We have a lot of people online. Are there any more questions online? I can unmute the phone if you need me to, or you can hit star six. Any more questions online? The conference is now in talk mode. Any more questions out there? Comments? Well, and also, too, for you people online, you know, my email is pressherejg at gmail.com. If you do send me an email, I will send you a pencil, one of the coveted pencils. Uh, <laughs> and more comments in the room? They're sharpened. Right. The conference is now in silent mode. I was introduced to um, Keith Stony 